Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's Sense of Feely Sparring Partners webinar, How Open Should Wireless Networks Be? with participation with IDC and Rakuten Symphony. Our speakers today are Jeff Hollingworth, Chief Marketing Officer at Rakuten Symphony, Daryl Schooler, Program Vice President of Worldwide Telecommunications at IDC, and Monica Paulini, Principal at Sensafili. I'm Kendra Chamberlain, and I will be moderating our webinar today. In Sparring Partners webinars, we watch our debaters discuss a topic live on video. We would like to encourage our audience to participate in the conversation. Please share your comments and questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. All comments are visible to all participants, so please keep the conversation polite and respectful. Our speakers will do their best to address questions as they go along, as they become relevant to the topics being discussed. So please do not hold your questions until the end. And one final reminder, please, as tempting as it is, do not use the chat function to share your comments. Feel free to include your comments in the Q&A button instead. Our panelists do not monitor the chat, and we'd like to make sure that they're seeing your comments. Okay, with that, I'll hand it over to Monica. Uh, Kendra, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, today we have a little bit of a special um, sparring partners because it started before today in a way. So uh, with uh, Jeff and I having a discussion over this uh, this topic and we thought, well, let's just uh, just have make this discussion public. And uh, I had to think of, you know, who else could join us? And uh, Daryl came to mind uh, as the obvious <laughs> must-have person on uh, on the sparring partners. He's been on uh, sparring partners before, and uh, in fact, we talked about open run. And I know that we can trust Daryl to give us not only his knowledge but also his. Uh, honest view on on this so today we're just going to have a very open discussion sorry it's a bad pun um and uh, um but we will just follow the pattern so i'm going to ask jeff and daryl to introduce themselves and then we'll get to talk about uh, what does it mean for uh, uh wireless networks to be open and it might seem like it's an obvious question but as you will see, it's, it's not quite that obvious. So, Jeff, why don't tell us who you are, what you do, and what is that? Why are we talking about this? I mean, just give us a sort of background on you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for inviting me to take part. So, my name is uh, Jeff Hollingworth. I am CMO of Rakuten Symphony. Just so that people understand what Rakuten Symphony is, I uh, Rakuten the Internet Services Group. I decided to build a mobile network about four years ago, starting in 2018. I, and they built uh, a completely virtualized uh, I, I open RAN I, uh, software network. And in, uh, it was in 2021, August, they realized that body of software was valuable for the total operator community. So they created another business interest called Rakuten Symphony to then, to then take that body of software and knowledge and understanding uh, and make it available to the global operator community. Uh, and I'll, I'll just, just to stoke the conversation, uh, the reason that Rakuten did that is because they experienced uh, large cost savings in their operations. They're now running 270,000 cells with 250 people. Uh, and it's not bad for a technology that people say isn't ready yet. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll have to go over that. So Daryl, what about you? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, as the introduction said, I am a program vice president here at IDC as part of the worldwide telecommunications team. In terms of the research that I'm doing here at IDC, uh, I contribute to what we call um, telecommunications insights, where within that practice, you know, I look at uh, the strategies, the drivers, the challenges that uh, telecommunications you know, globally are having in terms of, you know, adopting new technologies or, you know, trying to create platforms or monetizations of networks in terms of, you know, what kind of partners that they're looking for, what are their drivers in that way. So 
looking at uh, generally, you know, overall, as we say, you know, a lot of stuff about digital transformation these days of the operator, how they become a digital service provider and what's driving the choices that they're making. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to go right into it. I just want to remind everybody that if you wait to put your questions at the end, uh, you're out of luck because there is no Q&A at the end. So the questions have to come in. Also, you can just type in your comments. We are, uh, you know, curious, you can discuss among yourselves. So, you know, we do whatever, you do whatever. So it's completely open. Okay, um, sorry, it's just like, anyway, so openness. Openness is a word that has a very positive connotation. You know, you have a network, why not open it open? Why, the closure doesn't seem to be the right way to go. Um, and so there is, all, it's open RAN, but there's more than open RAN, there is open source, there is, uh, uh, you know, virtualization and all that. And uh, so, you know, um, and we are all supporting openness. But the question is, what really is openness? And is there a situation where you might have, you might just open it to a point where the openness becomes a complexity and manageable uh, set of relationships? And so where do we stand? So before we get to the too much openness, let's see, you know, what does having an open network mean? That you think maybe there you want to go first the, the with your um, analyst hat. What sure, I mean, well, I mean, in the context of this discussion, when when people ask about open RAN, you know, it's really about it's the interfaces within you know the traditional single source purpose built RAN. It's about opening up the different interfaces between the different functions. As I tell people, it's not really about like open software and a lot of those IT projects that you hear people talking about because no matter what the vendor is in the open RAN, they're still building you know, solutions based off of 3GPP. I believe they're all still bringing some of their own, you know, secret sauce to it. So I mean, it's not, so, so when I think of Open RAN, I think of uh, the interfaces. Broadly speaking, when I think of open or the goal of open, it's really about giving the operator more choices in terms of how they're going to deploy their network and who they're going to work with. And in terms of the scale of it, uh, you know, every operator is different. They have a different background. They come from a different place. So the degree of openness that they that, that they choose to go with, I think definitely, you know, is going to vary and has to be put into a larger context of, you know, what is the operator? What's their legacy? What's their strategy? What are their resources? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so technically when we talk about ORAN Alliance, it's like, you know, the interfaces between CRN yeah. and EU. But I think that, you know, conceptually what we think about openness and even when we think about open RAN, we have a, sort of a wider view. So Jeff, what do you, what do you, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I'm going to try and answer this through maybe an analogy in, in a different industry because there's nothing special that we're talking about here. There's nothing special with respect to telecom. I uh, so let's let's talk about the history of the car industry. Uh, now, the famous statement when the car industry first started was uh, Henry Ford and the Ford Model T. And he said, you can have it in any color as long as it's black. Uh, and he did that for one simple reason. He had no ability to scale his business efficiently and economically uh, and enable choice in his supply chain. Open is about choice in the supply chain. Now, as the automotive uh, industry progressed and consumer power increased and competition increased, then uh, people started to make different models of cars with different crazy things like different colors and different interiors. But still, you were choosing from five different choices, 10 different choices. You move now to how car the automotive supply industry works in the internet era. Uh, and the experience I had, if I, if I go to a BMW mini garage, I am literally choosing choices and I am assembling my car on demand. It's moved from a demand chain uh, rather than a supply chain. That affects how BMW and mini assemble those cars. They have changed their actual supply chain so that they can roll off cars with variety. Let's apply that to telecom now, and we can have a contentious debate on where we are in telecom. Are we Ford Model T era? Are we kind of having choices 
that we take to market. Uh, or uh, with that, certainly not. Let me put it this way: uh, we are not in a demand chain uh, industry yet, but the internet is, and the internet is eating our lunch, and we need to move into that model. Uh, and my last comment that I think is forgotten is that we've moved into a supply, uh, sorry, a software-based world. And software assembly is very, very different from hardware assembly. Uh, everybody understands that who understands software. And I don't think we fully incorporated that understanding uh, in our telecom industry. Yet. Now, it's a, it's a very good metaphor, but at the same time, you could argue that sort of there is an extreme view of open RAN where you'd be going into the BMW dealer and you say, you don't, it's not that you have just a choice of whatever models, whatever features are available, but you just say, well, you know, I want to have the seats from X and BMW never worked with X, but I want to have those. So there is a sense in which the, the choice is open, but it's not an infinite choice. So you're still bound by what BMW is willing to do for you. And, and so I think that that's where, at uh, which point do, do we get, you know, the operators who just put, pick anything or should there be some, or will there be some, some limitation? Well, we are in a business in telecom. I think we should remember that. And the, the parameters of choice are defined by the economic alignment to the business model. And, and that aligns to product market fit, value, uh, and supply. So I never hear in these conversations anything about us being in a business or really managing economic outcomes. Everything is that function. And then you have choices. There is nothing wrong with a fully closed operating model as long as you have an economic reason for doing that and you can manage the supply chain resilience behind it. Yeah, to extend the meta metaphor, though, after you buy the many, you can always take it to a custom shop and hire the equivalent of a auto mechanic system integrator who will put custom seats in for you. You just got to be willing to pay more for it and to be patient. It's going to take you longer to take it for a drive. Yes, and so that brings back the issue of cost, because it's not, I mean, if you choose your components, you might go for cheaper components and save costs. But on the other hand, if you do the equivalent of the special seats, well, that's actually going to add to the cost. Yeah. And in some cases, it might be worth it because you care about the seats. Right. That's fine. But it's not a cost saving strategy per se, which goes back to what Jeff was saying. We mm -hmm. need to think what makes sense from a financial point of view, not just from a feature point of view. Yeah, and that, that's why I say every operator is different in their approach to openness and who they want to work with very likely will be different. I mean, you know, they may go to, you know, one, you know, open, you know, RAN supplier system integrator that has a portfolio of, say, you know, 12 different options, and that's what they want. Or they may have a ton of money and a ton of talent inside the house and say, you know, we're going to build the whole thing ourselves and do whatever we want to. But you know, from operator to operator, some of this stuff is going to vary. Um, again, I mean, go back to Jeff's point, I mean, really, but the, you know, the, the underlying message of open or purpose of open is to give you more choices. How many of those choices the operator takes and how they make those choices is up to them. But the purpose is just to give them the option. Yeah, and then it's the people who, so there's a couple of thoughts that has just come up in this conversation, but that might be good just to seed out there. First off, that there's this, this concept that uh, open is cheaper and cheaper is less quality, and, and that's where you compromise. Completely not true, absolutely not true. Open can be more expensive if you do it the wrong way. And uh, we've proven that, that in Japan, that quality is at least at parity with the existing uh, approach. Uh, but it depends how you do it. I can build a really, really bad website, or I can build a really, really good website. I can build a really, really good website that economically is very, very bad. Or I can build a really, really good website that economically is really, really good. So that top right quadrant of where I just described is no different from a telecom. 
Yeah, and I guess that's for, for like, as you say, this is nothing special. You need to pick your bat battles. You, you need to find out what is that you need, what is that works for you. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I think that this is this is a problem that in our previous discussion sort of came up is that we tend to have a sort of like a, a standard view, but different people have a different view, but uh, uh, there is uh, oftentimes you have your t people articulate it, one view of what open RAN should be. And the truth is that there is no such thing because it depends on what kind of elements you need to bring together that work for you financially and functionally, because you need to have the performance and the cost. And there is no, you know, how many vendors do you need to have? Well, there is no answer to that. Maybe it's only one. Maybe I, it's I think, I think let, let's put the elephant in the room, though, because I think let's, let's all just, is it really ready? Is it ready? <laughs> is it ready? I mean, it's, it doesn't feel ready to me. Uh, just like the internet's not really ready. It's not done yet, so let's not do it. <laughs> let's, let's put the elephant out there. Daryl, are we ready? Um, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I mean, all right, so when people ask me about Rakuten, I say, you know, Rakuten shows the possibility, but that shouldn't be the peer you measure yourself against because most operators are you know, going to be brownfield deployments and they have legacy networks, legacy services and subscribers on that. So they have to be mindful of that. They have to think about the integration of that, the economics of that and open. Um, so when you get back to open and ready, I mean, certainly see like aspects of it are. I'm not, you know, sure about like say mid-band massive MIMO, if it is ready or not. We still haven't seen, you know, outside like Greenfield, like in Japan, what I call like a full large scale footprint of open RAN deployed anywhere. We haven't seen the large, you know, multinational national operators say 5G, let's start with open RAN as our bottom and go from there. So all that indicates to me that, you know, you know, open RAN, you know, certainly is not as mature as the traditional purpose built systems. And that there's still some, you know, issues to be worked out there. But on the other hand, this is still relatively new. So I mean, it wouldn't just, you know, discourage me as an operator, or I wouldn't use the current state of Open RAN today as the deciding factor what my roadmap looks like for a network. Yeah, and I guess you could say the same thing. You know. Is 5G mature today? And yes and no, because there's still things that we're still figuring out. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the 5G core, for instance. So, yeah. so it, it, that's, that's the way things work. Yeah. You start out in a, a, yeah, I was gonna say, sorry. I mean, South yeah. Korea was an example of that as one of the first networks. And then, then you saw after they deployed performance changes over the first 12 months after the vendors got everything up and then like, oh, now we have to go optimize. We gotta go improve, yeah. here's some more software. So, I mean, you know, the open RAN, you know, evolutionary path is no different than, you know, LTE or 5G was. I mean, you start off, it can, it's more difficult at the beginning than it is in five to 10 years from now. Yeah. I, I think in internet terms, in internet terms, uh, this technology is very old. It's, it's 15 years now. It's mature. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of the insights that, that we have found uh, I think from our experience in Japan, that's that's really important is that when you open something up, what it allows you to do is see inside and actually create the value chain in a different way. That's all. This is no different from how internet companies are changing how supply chain and value chains work in any other industry. Uh, and then you can get a very different outcome. And normally the outcome and the savings, by the way, you you don't want to... You don't want to hammer your supply chain to reduce costs. That's why we've ended up in telecom with two suppliers that the Western world can use. Uh, it's, it's you need to have supply chain resilience in the same way that Starbucks does for coffee beans. Uh, you manage the cost savings by putting it together, shortening time and being more aggressive from a business point of view. Uh, but the... I'm very confused when, when the industry has a conversation saying, quote, it's not ready. I'm also confused when we describe a brownfield operation as if it's one business. The other way to mentally model a brownfield 
or a greenfield is just a collection of either opportunity business models and gaps. So it's, it's a collection of greenfield opportunities or it's a collection of managing decline of brownfield opportunities. And I think the industry, the way we talk about this, uh, and I don't know if this translates into our inability to move into a software mindset, but it, it feels like we're just managing decline in, a, in one definition of a business model. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, as you say, you know, it's not one model. And in fact, you see a lot of operators just trying to get into open run slowly into it. So they might have a small deployment. And uh, I think that the problem here, the non-ready viewpoint is it's used to justify a position. So it's not ready. Therefore, you shouldn't um, you shouldn't deploy it or just wait forever. And I guess what I would say is that, yeah, there are some elements that are not mature in the same way that the traditional run is mature, which is inevitable, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go. It's not a question of, you're not gonna get the ready check at any point in time. It's just a, it's just a progression and you want to get started. So operators would start small where it makes sense for them and they get comfortable. They see what, how does it work? Uh, it would actually be troublesome if, you know, an, uh, an existing large operator decides, well, we're just going to go to open RAN for all our network tomorrow. That would just make no sense. It's not, and it's not a question of maturity. It's just not, what do you do? So I think that we need to be realistic. And I think that a lot of the time, the, 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 the viewpoint is used to justify something else rather than being an assessment of the technology. Yeah, I think we've got a really good question, actually. I'm just, I don't want to yes. dance around. Uh, mm -hmm. but, sure, go ahead. Uh, because Ken has just asked, isn't, isn't being ready a function of management incentives to transition to a different business model, staff change management, software-centric staff, software or into product managers? I a thousand percent agree with Ken and that comment. The, the two things that I think are the real difference between uh, what Rakuten has done and uh, and kind of people that haven't done it, it started with mindset. That mindset was an internet and services mindset. And it started with, with kind of building. And, and it started from zero people, by the way. It doesn't take an army. It takes just a, a small number of good people. Uh, but they have to have the right skill sets. And those are software and uh, internet. Learning telecom is not hard. Yeah, but finding those skill sets can be hard. Okay, I know going back, I mean, and this isn't just open RAN, this is broader within telecom as they want to become digital service providers and adopt more of the, you know, the cloud service provider business models and technologies that, you know, from our research, I mean, telecom operators do see hiring the people with those skill sets or finding the people with those skill sets as a challenge in terms of the transformation, whether it's open RAN, Mac, cloud centers, whatever. I mean, so, so to his question, I mean, that is part of the maturity and part of, you know, what needs to be done to do that transformation is though for the operators to find that talent. And one of the challenges I think they're running against is the perception of telecom. I mean, you, you talk about it being, you know, struggling not to go, you know, managing downward. Uh, one of the things I've used is, you know, aspirational, stop looking like a turtle and try to look like a cheetah. That, you know, they're trying to get that talent. They're competing for people who are also applying to Google and Apple and companies like that. Yeah, and I, I think we are we are trying to change that uh, uh, paradigm across it up with and on behalf of uh, of the whole industry. And one of the things that is our key strategic initiative is how do we scale skill set development mm -hmm. inside the industry. This is the most important industry in the world if you look forward we are aligned in terms of values with with the people who are highly talented coming out of university i'm not so sure when i speak to those people they really want to go and help a company run an ad business that you know is mining people for for uh, kind of like wealth somewhere else uh but there has to be there has to for, i, I I have quoted the moment, and I believe this more and more each time I speak, I believe this is like 1961, where JFK decided we need to do something different, we need to go to the moon, we need to fix a lot of different things that are not really very good. 
I think telecom has an opportunity to take that role, be that technology enabler, but it has to embrace the technologies around it uh, and build a supply chain that, that benefits the total ecosystem of, of technology. We haven't done that. As, as things have improved around us in the internet, because it's, quote, not ready, we've increasingly isolated the telecom industry from any kind of value creation. Yeah, and I think that, so going back to the, the actually the first question about what is openness, uh, which we, we sort of like initially tried to dis, do define as being now just open RAN, we're talking about openness in general. I think that, you know, oftentimes when we just talk about open RAN and open interfaces, we kind of, it's just too narrow to really get the overall opportunity of open uh, run and open uh, openness because it's just going to affect the whole business uh you know end to end so it's not just uh, uh, a run thing now we have another question follow-up question from ken uh, that wants to know how you are recruiting stuff and i think that there are actually there are two i would add another question is how, how do you recruit staff but also there is a question of culture of the existing staff now you guys obviously don't have that problem because you're not a legacy business but but there is a question that you're not going to fire everybody and hire everybody new so you have to also deal with the people that are already in your organization top at the first to to get them to change their approach and culture yeah and this is a great question and if you you ever want to get Tarek truly, Tarek Amin, the guy who runs this business, truly passionate. It's not about technology, it's about skill set. Uh, a Rakatan recruited directly out of universities. There's, there's now 72 different nationalities that are involved. Uh, I, the, uh, there was a big push in, in terms of making people understand what was possible. Uh, and empowering those people to be able to do it. Now, when, when we speak to different customers around the world, we always have this skill set question. We never, we, this is never going to be solved by adding another box, doing another G. It's not a technology problem. It's a, a mindset, skill set, software problem. And one of the things we've discussed is let's help recruit people out of universities, rotate people through Japan, we'll put them through a six month boot camp. We'll, we'll kind of, uh, what do you call them? Kind of submerge them into, into that culture, both at the executive level and also at the, the, the software level, and then spin that back and we'll help you build the nucleus of a working organization. Uh, the, again, where I, I get worried that the, the people that say this is not ready, by the way, are the people not doing it because it's an easy way out, very honestly. Uh, now, it's also, there's maybe not incentives to do it. There's maybe not risk, you know, it's, there's misalignment. So I, I don't, uh, I, I am really impressed by the talent and knowledge of people in the industry. I am less impressed by the organizational process, governance and decision making. I think it's an organizational problem. It always is. Uh, but but we, we feel our biggest barrier to success and the biggest barrier to changing this industry, is why, which is why we're doing it, is this discussion around skill set, getting the youth in, uh, the next generation, and letting them go to town rather than them choosing to send you a, an advert faster uh, than, uh, you know, in the hope that you're going to click and they get a percentage. I kind of think Rakuten's got an advantage, though, over some of your peer telecom operators, given that you come out of the internet and cloud space, or they come out of the, you know, local dial-up space, that from the top down, your, everybody your, your, your in, leadership everybody. understands this more, or has been exposed to it more, versus, you know, people who, again, come out of legacy telecom. Yeah, everybody in the world starts with advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. Uh, apparently there's a lot of money flowing through telecom that could mm -hmm. be applied in a different way. If you reduced your cost structure for building networks 30%, that 30% could be applied into investing into software delivery and doing something else. Uh, I also don't think we should be looking at making yesterday's internet better, but fixing the internet of today into tomorrow. 
So it always makes me laugh the, uh, maybe that's an English way of saying it, the, uh, uh, in anything you do in a private or public life, there's always advantages and disadvantages. There's always people who can choose to focus on disadvantages or focus on maximizing the advantages. Uh, and uh, I, I, it's a mindset, skill set thing again. Yeah, and I, and I guess you have to sort of realize that you try to max, you try to optimize what you do, what you have, mm -hmm. what you want to do, what kind of how much money you have, and all of that. There's no right or wrong answers. It's just a, a question of being willing to really look at facts and data honestly, and see what's the best way forward, rather than just you know following whatever the the your vendor is telling you or. Your the, analyst is telling I, you whatever. The, uh, 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 I think one thing that we we also can add to this, and, and this is true in uh, in uh, Rakuten Mobile and now in Rakuten Symphony, this is hard. It's harder than not doing something. Always doing something where you haven't done it before is harder. Uh, but what you tend to do is you get the second order benefits because you do the hard first order things. If, if you want to lose weight, you have to stop eating as much uh, and you see the effects. Don't just wake up every morning and see if you've lost weight. How about you actually change your exercise and your diet? And that's, that's a bit, uh, I'll give one example that I think is really important to understand if something is ready or not. And this is how the internet works. I, uh, Interfaces on the internet are not ready. They change all the time. If you are running an internet business, you have to accommodate the readiness inside the different browsers so you get a seamless experience for your service. Been doing it for 10, 15 years. It's called a shim. There's libraries that abstract away the lack of preparedness and the blocking underneath. I mean, inside Rakuten Mobile, they did a shim to enable Nokia to integrate seamlessly their radio units into the overall operation. There's now nine different radio units that all have a common interface. Uh, it's just using the same software model that a JavaScript developer uses. Uh, but it allows Rakuten to run all those different nine vendors exactly the same way. Yes. Uh, so I'm um, sort of looking at the questions. There is another question about why uh, brownfield operators are only starting small, uh, sometimes even quite small when it comes to open RAN. Uh, I think I mentioned it already is that you just want to gradually, you know, change is good yeah. and even though it requires work, but you don't want to be overdoing it either. Sure. Unless you are a greenfield, I don't know, uh, Daryl, is that what you were seeing as well? Or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they, they're putting it in a place where, you know, um, if it should go wrong, it damages them, it minimizes the damage. I mean, so, so they're not going to take something that, you know, if they're working with a brand new set of vendors or architecture or something like that, you know, like it's, they're going to put it someplace where it may not be the highest level of traffic. You know, they're not going to put it in downtown London. They're going to stick it somewhere out in the country first and say, can it work well there before we move it up? I mean, it's uh, going back to the car metaphor, you know, you, you, Car racers, you know, they start out on those country tracks before they get to go to, you know, Formula One or IndyCar or NASCAR here in the United States. I mean, so they stick it someplace, you know, where it minimizes the damage. Uh, one example, another example I give some people sometimes, a little bit different though, I mean, look how Verizon introduced Samsung into its radio network. It started off by doing small cells with Samsung in more isolated traffic areas. So if Samsung didn't, you know, perform to their standard, it minimizes the damage. So I think, you know, that, that's why you see a lot of the open RAN deployments have been out, you know, in less dense traffic areas to begin with, to get the operator comfortable with everybody involved before they move it into a higher profile, higher traffic area. Yeah, and, and I think this is why I trigger so kind of like immediately when people in a blanket statement say it's not ready yet so we're not going to do anything the implication is oh we have, can't start until 2027 or 2028 i uh, the the message that i would have as a 
an, an ongoing operation. Every year, every year, hundreds of millions of dollars are invested in, in new build, new operations. Uh, what percentage do you want to invest in there around something new? I, and that's a question of your risk appetite. Rakuten in, in Japan, given their, their scenario, invested 100%. Now, obviously, I, I would not recommend any brownfield uh, or existing operator to do that. But once you've decided how much you want to invest, the most important thing is what can you learn from that investment so that in six to 12 months time, you can decide whether to increase investment or decrease investment based on t intelligent insight rather than it's not ready yet, it is ready yet. Uh, that's question number, that's statement number one. Statement number two, which is just basic software approach. You prove you, it's not very interesting to prove you can do something once unless you can do it for 10,000 times with the same cost structure. So make sure that when you are building this, this investment, you are actually solving the real problem, which is the second order effect. Uh, because you're really dealing here with automated uh, software reassembly uh, where you don't have people in it. You have software and platforms running your network. I don't see a lot of people running down to Wall Street anymore placing trades. That's because they're all looking at the software platform that does it for them. And that's, that's how that industry has changed. If we can't do that, I don't think we can keep up with the speed of change in, in communications and and the industry will not, despite its desires to own the internet of sensors in 6G, it won't, it won't be there. It will be providing electricity. Yeah, now um, we're gonna get to Ken's question, which is basically about uh, how, how do you make sure that there is uh, interoperability and can ensure that. But one way that operators can do, can go and are going about it is like, having a small deployment or open RAN, but also they can have an open RAN deployment where there is only a single vendor so that you re reduce complexity. Because no matter how you do it, it's not a question so much of being ready or not ready. The more vendors you have, the more complexity you necessarily have. That's not an open RAN issue. That's everywhere, right? <clears throat> so uh, one possibility is like, okay, you have single vendor end to end, open RAN topology, but does that, count as open RAN because it's not really open, even though you might be using the open RAN interface. Well, let, let me start and then I'll keep this very short and then we'll go over to Daryl. Uh, the, the philosophy in general I've always had in business is you never outsource a problem, you outsource a solution. So as long as you maintain control of understanding of what somebody is actually delivering, across those interfaces and you maintain control of being able to decide if that's good or bad, then it's a difference between designing something and choosing how to deliver it. Uh, and those two things are really, really important. I think the industry needs, does need to invest in understanding how software supply chain and software like digital integration happens rather than like uh, systems integration. Boy, I'd like to really mix it up and disagree with Jeff, but actually I agree with him. Um, in, in my opinion, if an operator goes single vendor end to end, long as in terms of the planning stage and the vendor selection, you know, they ensure that they got the open interfaces in place and they function per, you know, as they are, to me, that is open RAN because this is a you know, it goes back to a business question. I mean, some operators may not have the resources to want to integrate a bunch of vendors. Others may, you know, for whatever reason, just don't want to, but they want the open interface for insurance. That if say, you know, their primary vendor, you know, gets bought or acquisition or gets on the naughty list of some government that, you know, say they can get rid of that virtual DU and CU and bring another vendor in, but still keep the radio. So to, I think, you know, the drivers for each operator, again, is gonna be different. Some may wanna to stitch together a bunch of different people and look for best of every type of performance at every part of the RAN. While other ones may say, you know, we're happy with the single vendor, but we want the open interface for insurance down the road. 
And both of them, in my mind, are open RAN. I mean, because no one there, you know, we, we had this like, you know, and I'm sure the analyst community, you know, we killed a lot of PowerPoints out there, probably in some ways, you know, just talking about all the different vendors you can stitch together, but some of that's aspirational. Some of that is just kind of showing you here's the ultimate way you can do it, but doesn't mean the other way isn't. I mean, you know, a Fiat is just as much of a car as a BMW, just one of them I'd want to own and the other one I wouldn't. Yeah, and they that both have the common components in the supply chain, by the way. I just want to point that out. It's got nothing to do with supply chain. BMW just has got a different product market fit and yeah. invests in different places. That's all. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great point. But actually, so there is a, a further up. So I, I, I'm with you. I think that, you know, if you have, because Open RAN is more than just having multiple vendors, you can have one vendor and still call it open ran and, and the thing is that who, who cares really you can call it whichever way you want as an operator you just do only, whatever only you don't have to that have to forecast care i'm sorry i said only analysts that have to forecast the market care so uh, okay so let me ask you this since uh uh you know that's you know we have to deal with forecasts all the time mm -hmm. so if you have equipment that is uh, supports the open ran interface but it's not deployed in an open run network. And we actually don't know because if an operator buys the equipment, we don't know what they're going to do with it. I mean, in, in terms mm -hmm. of, is it going to be, so <clears throat> it's going to be single vendor, multiple vendor. Um, it, what might look like there is a, a huge open run market because most of the vendors are actually, um, uh, you know, uh, releasing open run um, equipment that supports open run even if it's in a single vendor. So, is that going to lead to an inflation or is that right? That's actually the way it should be. I mean, I think that that's perfectly fine to have that kind of market forecast that reflects the potential of the of the equipment rather than how it's deployed because we can't control for that. Well, and, and then maybe this is where the, the challenge with this conversation becomes a little bit more real because it it involves in it involves humans and uh, uh, humans have different drivers depending on where you are and it's disingenuous uh, so uh, we as a race our power is that we've created a language that creates labels and those labels allow us to discuss things in abstract uh, but those labels are used as weapons depending on if you want to slow something down if you want to speed something up uh, it's really very very hard uh, to understand especially for the analyst side uh, and I was looking at this, uh, it's the, I was looking at a report that was saying how far ahead the US is in terms of open RAN deployment, based on the fact that uh, the large operators have, quote, bought something that is open RAN ready, open RAN ready. Uh, the, uh, now, if those operators uh, can choose to open up those interfaces and integrate other people in and be in control of that, uh, then that's very valuable. But if, if it's something that's put there as a marketing term to maintain a status quo, that's, that's, that's a very different market. But it, it, it comes down to, again, there's, I think we get lost and that it's really hard from an analyst point of view. I think there's my, my empathy goes out a thousandfold. I, the, uh, I think it's, it's, it's like this academic purist conversation the industry gets stuck into where everyone gets excited for the wrong reasons. Yeah. So, Daryl, what, what's uh, open RAN ready? Uh, marketing term. <laughs> A weasel word. I, mean, I, I never, I never seen anywhere in any standards or specification group where there's a you know group to define what readiness is. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you, thanks, I mean, so, so if you say I've deployed something that's open RAN ready, what the heck does that really mean? I mean, you know, it, it from one vendor to another, it can mean something totally different, and it doesn't mean it is going to be completely like ORAN specification, meet, you know, everything. Don't um, you think this conversation is a bit very similar to how we've missed the point almost as an industry? Because for the last five years, we've been chanting that 5G is going to change the world and the industry. And again, it's this conversation that doesn't seem to relate to anything that we recognize 
being important and solving real world problems. Uh, and then people will say, well, it's not here yet. It's, it's not ready. advanced. It's not ready. The maturity question. ready. When it comes, it will be amazing. And it's going to be trillions of dollars. Uh, and I'm trying to understand why we spend our energy doing that and who it's serving. Yes, I know. It's yeah, because that, and then you have the sense of so what was the point of it since it didn't change our life? But we're so good to it. It doesn't it, not everything has to be life changing to be worth it. You know, yeah, there's two things that probably kill me before the uh, connectivity go. It's probably water and electricity. They're the other two that kind of are powering my growth as an individual in society. And I'd just like to say thank you to both those industries because I don't know what G they're on, but it's tremendous. <laughs> so so in general, let me, all this stuff comes with, you know, a lot of this stuff is just way over promised. I mean, it's just unfortunately, it's kind of the nature of the industry. They they give you like this aspirational goal to aim for but rarely is it ever totally achieved or by the time you get there it looks different than what you started with I mean I think about going way back in my career you know sitting through when I was still looking at like fixed broadband people talking about remote medicine and surgery and they're still putting that in powerpoint slides for 5g it's like some things just never go away and we just have to be honest and put our filters on yeah, but we you know, like, if you look at remote surgery, yeah, it's not quite here yet. But there is a lot of like Zoom uh, remote, mm. uh, and that's really not rocket science, but it's actually very helpful. So there are a lot of things that are actually happening, and they're better. So we shouldn't just dismiss this whole thing. Now, Daryl, let me ask you this: because yeah. when I see a market forecast, an open RAN versus non-open RAN, and whatever, mm. I go like, eh. I mean, does it even make sense to distinguish at some point where everybody's going to just, you know, support it? And what, what do you, how, how do you read those forecasts without, you know, going into the specifics? Does it make sense to have a separate open RAN forecast? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and for a lot of different reasons, some of it is just commercial because it depends on, you know, what people asked you to produce for them. But no, I think overall, it does help give some sense of, I guess, the impact of open RAN on the total RAN market. Um, it certainly provides insight into, you know, the analysts you're dealing with in terms of how they view the rate of maturity of the industry. But it kind of goes back to the other question, though. You got to understand the methodology of how the person is putting together the forecast and the assumptions that they're making. You know, are they including open RAN readiness versus deployed as open RAN? So I mean, all those things go into it. But I do think there's some value in that in being able to kind of get a sense of the impact it's had on the market. And I guess from an open RAN perspective, or a vendor. Who's involved in this it kind of also kind of gives you an idea of thinking about you know, what do you think your addressable market is what is the appetite out there um hey i want to hijack this real quick yeah, just go back to one thing we talk about mm -hmm. um uh, maturity of this market one thing anybody listening I, I would advise them look at the size of the trials when they're announced because i think that's a good indication of the maturity because if you go back about three years again racketon's the exception so we'll just you know leave them out of the discussion when I'm looking at a lot of the original trials are like, you know, when you really looked at it, it's like, oh, it's three sites or six sites. And then about in 12 months, it started growing up to being like 20, 40, 100 sites. And now you see people announcing, oh, we're going to have a trial that's like two or 3,000 sites. So even though you don't see, you know, most operators saying, you know, open ran throughout our full network right now, we're stripping everything out and doing that. I do think it's a positive in terms of the maturity that you're seeing that the size of trials being announced continues to grow exponentially year after year. And, and where we want to engage in that conversation, I think that's a good point because we don't think that the challenge is doing one site, three sites, five sites. Yeah. It's how you actually industrialize the automation of that to go to 10,000 sites. Mm -hmm. So there's a very good key metric is just what the operational cost per additional site is. I, uh, uh, and that then forces you into a software mindset and control. So I the that's the secret that Rakuten has done. It's not open RAN was something that allowed them to do the software automation 
that gave the business results. Uh, and it's no different from working with the APIs in the different browsers if you're a web developer. Now, let's get to Ken's question, but I'd like to kind mm -hmm. of trick it a little bit. Because, so he, Ken is asking, at the risk of being top down, there might be a role for a plan, for a pan-industry approach, for instance, GSMA or government industry strategy approach, uh, as in it has an example here um i mean what one one possibility because right now the, the interface is defined by the oran alliance but you could have it move to 3gpp and there are various views about that and it's not going to happen anytime in a, in a short term um but that sort of brings the question of how do you ensure interoperability right uh because you can have an interface uh but then uh and you might be sort of interoperable in the sense that things work together but they don't work together with the same performance level and that's where so there is a question of uh, are the open interfaces enough and uh should they be you know standardized in a different like in 3gpp and and then and then I think we should also spend some time talking about system integration because that's where you actually at, at this point in time that's the way you have to do to make sure things work together. What's I'm going to let you go, Daryl, because I think like most of a year ago. ago. Um, I mean, I do think it's important to have some sort of neutral body out there that is doing some, you know full standardization around open so that we can make sure from one vendor to another that it's everybody's defining it the same way so that there is greater ease of moving around and reduces the need for a system integrator to some degree in there. Um, and, you know, my thing is for a while though, I, I think, you know, as we start looking into the next generation that you're going to see more of the open RAN interfaces being built into the next standard from the ground up, which may address some of this. Does he mean 6G? Yeah, yeah. So I think there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting challenge in telecom that other industries have, have started to come, come past in, in the network side. So if I open the front door of any telecom operator and I look behind it, it's just an amorphous mass of customized software operations, hardware. It's like looking at the history of computing through that door. Uh, the, uh, there is no repeatability. There's no software supply chain in there. The ugliness of, of network, uh, uh, mobile networks is the fact that it is a systems integration uh, business. Uh, and that makes it really hard for software product people uh, to address telecom and, and actually have VCs that want to back them. So there's a lack of innovation from that. Now, for us that have been around long enough, that looks very much like the device handset market in about 2003, 2004, 2005. If you wanted to get your software distributed into this like burgeoning world, uh, you were speaking to the different handset providers. It took a year. They controlled how you did it. It was customized. I, so I think we have to, part of this journey is, is actually building a software product supply chain into the industry. And that's where you start to get the diversification of the supply chain, uh, because then we are nowhere near plug and play. It lets be very clear in what we're doing in Rakuten, we're maybe 20 to 30% of the way through this journey. And we probably will always be maximum halfway through because the journey never ends. But we are able to introduce different software supply chain in a repeatable model because we are starting to architect and structure at the software level, the supply chain, which allows us to automate that and, and take time out of delivery. Uh, I mean, I just want to point out that the... We have nine different radio vendors supplying into Rakuten Mobile today. Uh, they all plug into the exact same operational interface. Doesn't matter, it's managed, it's a femto, it's indoor, it's macro, sub six, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, if the interfaces require something, you shim it out. Uh, the, uh, and and that's, that's, how, that's how you can start to scale this in. But there is an invisible, 
there's always when you've got an SI customization. Oh, and this is where, this is my last comment. We keep saying we're a standardized industry. Whenever I go into any kind of operation, there's about 20% of what exists is built on standard interfaces. I mean, the, there's some very good customizations in the radio level that solve real world problems. Uh, and, and they're really valuable. Uh, but it's, it's only lock in if you don't understand what you're buying from a solution point of view, if you've just outsourced the problem, that's all. Yeah, and, and I guess that that's sort of like, the, that's how the whole discussion started when you have at the system integration level, uh, you, you, need, you need to kind of narrow down what you can do. So you cannot just say any vendor is welcome, any vendor will just come in and plug in. You, you just cannot promise it as a system integrator because you need to protect your promise to the, to the client. You can't promise anybody can, as long as they support the interface, can come in. So there is a sense in which, you know, as you say, you want openness, but at some point from the system integration, whoever makes it, is that the operator or uh, another entity, you have to kind of narrow it down. So this idea of infinite openness is just not, it's just not work. It, it's, it's never work in any, not, not, not just open RAN. So the question, and I think it's very important that how you define this, this is lock in if you're not know what you're getting into if you're signing a blank check, you know, so, so the question is to understand what the limitations are and say, well, that's real, that's good for me. That's where I want to be rather than deny that those things exist. Yeah. The way you've just made me think that open in this industry is a bit like uh, Miss Congeniality and Sandra Bullock. She, and when she says, and world peace, it's very, it's kind of, okay, <laughs> that's uh, that's great, but can we win a business? Uh, and can we understand what we're trying to achieve and then how we supply to that? And my last comment is that my, I do have a concern in the industry, and this is maybe, I, I think you should get Ken on, by the way, into your next sparring <laughs> partners, because he's really active from a question point of view. Uh, the, uh, I'm a bit worried the industry tries to do the new thing the old way. And if you try and do the new thing the old way, you will get a poorer performing uh, old way of doing things. Uh, so there is a, a, a requirement that the mind opens up into the mindset and then the question about what markets you have to attack and what skills you need to do that. That's not an RFP process that buys technology in an additional box, FYI. It's more of a culture. It's more of a business outcome mm -hmm. agreement. That's, that's where we feel it is. And that's how we work with our suppliers. We say, this is the business outcome we need to achieve. Uh, we appreciate you need a business. So if we have these business goals and you have your business goals and you're happy with that, then can we prove we can do it once? And if we can prove we can do it once, the only question is how we repeat it at the same cost structure. Uh, that's exactly how we've managed to work with both big suppliers and small suppliers the same way. Yes, and, and I guess that in that context, the interfaces is just step number one, and then there is many more to come. And uh, uh, maybe Daryl, uh, we have a couple of minutes, left. we can mm -hmm. take the last question, which is, what is the main motivation of having an open RAN? Have we achieved the objective yet? I think it's kind of a, a good question to sort of close yeah. up the our discussion. Um, I, I mean, I think in terms of the I don't know if anybody's really achieved their objectives yet with it because it's still overall a, um, you know, it's still like again, like we've just said, you know, operators are still in the process of evaluating and rolling out and deciding how to use it. But in terms of the goals or the reasons why they're doing, it, I I think again that they vary. I think you know, in some cases, operators want insurance. They want some idea that in the future they can swap out. Other operators want best of breed. Um, some operators, I think, see it as part, not just about RAM, but more of a holistic view. And this goes to my thing of kind of about like culture change from down that, you know, they're not in a running a hardware business that they are running a software business and having that mentality and open RAN is just part of that overall 
you know, switch to being a digital service provider and taking on, you know, more of the aspects of, you know, the, the digital economy, the digital service providers out there in terms of the cloud and moving to software, the idea of faster upgrades and things of that nature. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, it, again, the objectives, you know, for the operators is, is going to be different, um, you know, and some of it may, you know, to bring in new suppliers into their supply chain as well. So I think overall it's, you know, different by operator. Um, but I think, you know, overall, this is still, in my opinion, a relatively new approach to building your radio access network. So you can't really say that all these objectives have been, been, been achieved yet by, you know, the mass of operators. Yeah, and I guess, you know, the diversity, the fact that every operator has a different way to go about it is actually very good to validate what is important about open RAN or openness in general, because everybody will try, some will be more successful than others. And uh, and we will see. I think that that's much more interesting than having everybody doing the same thing. So, Jeff, just your quick final thoughts. We're at the top of the hour. Yeah, very, very quickly. I think we should. I think we should uh, address, and we haven't done it so far. Telecom is a very different industry. It's a, it's a country critical resource. Governments have a big role in this, and governments do need. You know, they they play a role in unlocking. Uh, what happens in markets. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that's where Rakuten came from, that the Japanese government decided that there should be a fourth operator. Uh, uh, that regulation isn't evenly distributed across now different modern internet providers versus, you know, what, what is, is regulated. I think, though, that is going to play into the future of the industry as as we understand that the countries want to have more uh, control and development inside their own ecosystems in the next 10 years, in terms of, of competitiveness at software level, company level, investment level versus the last 10 years. And I think telecom, I think telecom can play a, a massive role in enabling that that's much more important than the industry. But I really wish we could start having those discussions more than kind of is it ready or not this open thing absolutely well we have to get going but we could be talking for another few hours i feel here but uh, we won't uh we, we need to keep going with our uh, lives and uh, so i'll hand it over to kendra okay great thank you monica that will conclude our webinar for today Thank you to our speakers for that great conversation. And thank you to our audience members for those great questions. A recording of today's webinar will be available at the sensafili.com website in the coming days. And we have two upcoming sparring partners. The next one will be on June 22nd on inclusion and diversity in the telecom industry. And then we'll have another one on June 29th about 5G. Registration for those two webinars will be available at sensafili.com. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.